Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Planetarium Watch Party for the show Invaders of Mars. I'm your host, Scott Young, the Planetarium Astronomer at the Manitoba Museum, and I will be taking you through our program, which looks at the red planet and all of the robotic invaders that have been sent from Earth to explore that particular planet. This is part of our spring break festivities. Of course, normally we have a whole bunch of activities for spring break. It's the busiest week of the year down at the Manitoba Museum. And um, this year, only the museum galleries are open, but they are open and there's a bunch of new things in there. Some of the galleries have been renovated and so on. So you can go down and visit the museum from 11 to five every day during spring break. Unfortunately, the Planetarium and Science Gallery are not open yet, but in, uh, in lieu of that, we're running some planetarium programs for you online. And so this is one of them today. Our show is called Invaders of Mars, and it is produced by the people that made our planetarium system, the Digistar Planetarium System. It's about 25 minutes long. And then after that, I'll be back with you and we will be doing a Q&A and we'll also be doing a um, little bit of an update. The show was produced a few years ago and, and some new discoveries have come out since then. Uh, my colleague Mike is in the, in the background and he'll be looking at some of the chats and putting, at some, uh, putting some of the um, cool comments and, and add-ons out into the chats in Facebook and YouTube. And uh, I'll be answering some of the questions as well. And then we'll both be back to, uh, to help you out at the end of the show. So without any further ado, sit back and relax. I hope you enjoy our planetarium presentation of Invaders of Mars, and then I will be back with you in just a little while right after the show. After 10 months and traveling hundreds of millions of miles across the void of space, a robot spacecraft built on one planet lands on another. An interplanetary first. Science fact, not fiction. The date July the 20th, 1976. The planet, Mars. To the Babylonians, it was Nergal, god of death and destruction. Its distinct red color signified blood and violence. In Norse mythology, it was Tyre, god of combat and heroic glory, after whom we named the day of the week called Tuesday. For thousands of years, this planet intrigued early sky watchers, and our fascination continues to this day. We call it after the name of the Roman god of war, Mars. Mars Hill, Flagstaff, Arizona. Observations made here would color our ideas of Mars for over half of the 20th century. Astronomer Percival Lowell built a giant telescope here, specifically to study the red planet. He dedicated over 15 years of his life attempting to solve the mystery of its changing appearance. Before Lowell's observations, it was known that Mars was about 4,000 miles across, rotated once in just over 24 hours, and had a year almost two Earth years in duration. Intriguingly, it also appeared to have seasons. At its closest, it was a mere 35 million miles away. Gazing through his telescope, Lowell carefully studied the different views that Mars presented him from day to day and month to month. Of course, this was no easy task. Earth's atmosphere caused the image to constantly shimmer and weave around. It was quite a challenge for the human eye to spot such elusive surface details. Still, Lowell was not deterred. He painstakingly recorded fascinating scenes, polar caps that shrank and expanded, changing dark areas and long lines that joined them all together. He was certain that he had observed lines of vegetation planted on the banks of giant canals. Canals that brought water from the poles to irrigate the planet's vast deserts. 
and that all of this was built by Martians. Until the 1960s, many people actually believed that the Martian surface was crisscrossed by artificial canals built by intelligent Martian life forms. As our view of Mars improved, we began to see fewer and fewer lines. But even in the 1960s, our ability to see Mars from Earth was still very poor by today's standards. And so, mystery and imagination ruled. Imagine the surprise and disappointment when in July 1965, the Mariner 4 spacecraft flew past Mars and revealed a cold, lifeless world. As it sped past the planet, its primitive camera beamed to Earth scenes of a beautiful desolation. No canals, no cities, no vegetation, no Martians. Other sensors recorded freezing temperatures and an extremely thin atmosphere. An apparently dead world in a deep freeze. Six years later, Mariner 9 became the first artificial satellite of Mars. It arrived when Mars was totally obscured, hidden beneath a vast planet-wide dust storm. Four mysterious dark spots slowly emerged beneath the swelling clouds. These were the tops of giant volcanoes. When the dust cleared, it revealed a planet much more dynamic than expected. There were features formed by dark dust and strong winds, craters like mud splats, strange meandering features that looked like dried up riverbeds, and a vast canyon that spanned the surface. Mariner revealed an exotic planet with an interesting past and an even more exciting future for exploration. It's July 1976, and the first spacecraft lander from Earth sits atop the mysterious Martian surface. It's the most sophisticated space robot yet made. Within minutes, its scanning cameras slowly construct the first pictures from Mars. In black and white, they reveal a rather bleak, boulder-strewn surface with distinct hills and crater rims in the distance. A series of filters applied to this image provided the first color picture from Mars. It revealed an amber sky with dusty clouds high in the super-thin atmosphere. In color, it was a much more welcoming world. Six weeks later, Viking 2 landed 4,000 miles away on top of a small rock and almost tipped over. This landing site was nearly identical. Boulders covered with tiny holes, volcanic in origin, litter the surface. Both landers searched for traces of life in the soil, but all the results were disappointingly negative. The soil itself was mostly sandy silicon with lots of iron oxide, essentially rust which gives Mars its red color. The carbon dioxide atmosphere was found to be 100 times thinner than Earth's, but still thick enough for weather to occur. Each Viking spacecraft consisted of a lander and an orbiter. The electronic eyes of the orbiters allowed us for the first time to experience the planet's features in considerable detail.
we are heading towards the rim of the canyon named after the Mariner spacecraft. Valles Marineris is over 4,800 kilometers long. It would span the entire United States or Australia and is nearly 10 kilometers deep and 120 kilometers across. The entire Grand Canyon of Arizona would easily be lost in just one of its tributaries. In fact, canyon is far too small a word to describe this chasm. It's more like a vast fracture on the planet's surface, like the Great Rift Valley in Africa or the San Andreas Fault. Here, the planet was torn apart by great stresses, probably emanating from the huge volcanic structure nearby, known as the Tharsis Ridge. Flying over the Tharsis Ridge, we look down on an immense volcanic bulge in the planet's surface. This dome of lava could cover all of Europe to the height of Mount Everest. It's here that we find four of the largest volcanoes ever discovered. The most striking of them all is Olympus Mons, the biggest, broadest, tallest volcano in the solar system so far. It is so big that if you were on its slope, you would scarcely be aware of the true size of this volcanic monstrosity. It has a vent at the top into which you could fit Los Angeles and still have room to spare. Most recent data suggests that these giant volcanoes may have been active just a few million years ago. The Viking orbiters also gave us our first close-ups of two tiny potato-shaped moons. Both skim relatively close to the Martian surface and are most likely captured asteroids. Both are regarded as good landing spots for future Mars exploration missions. Here is the largest, Phobos. This captured asteroid is about 22 kilometers across, with gravity so light that an average human would only weigh a couple of ounces. Phobos skims across Mars at an average height of just under 6,500 kilometers, its orbit spiraling ever closer to the planet. Its surface is dominated by craters, cracks, and fractures. They all emanate from Stickney, a massive crater about 10 kilometers across. However, this is nothing compared to the crater Phobos will make on Mars when it finally gets too close and crashes into the surface in just 100 million years from now. Gently moving outward from Mars, is its other, smaller moon, Deimos, only about 15 kilometers across. Its surface is extremely dark and very smooth. It seems to be covered in a deep layer of dust that fills many of its craters. Like our own moon, it keeps one face permanently turned towards the planet. It orbits Mars every 30 hours at a distance of about 24,000 kilometers. The Viking missions changed our view of Mars yet again. Then we understood it as a sterile world, 
with a surface frozen in time for the last two and a half billion years. This was the accepted scientific opinion for the next 20 years. But in the late 1990s, a new era of Mars exploration began and continues to this day. From Earth, we launched an armada of landers, rovers and orbiters. Mars was invaded as never before. And the new data we found started to reveal even more of its deep secrets. 21 years after Viking, the Pathfinder mission reopened Martian surface exploration with Sojourner, the first roving vehicle that crept along at the dizzying speed of one centimeter per second. That's one kilometer in almost 12 days. This mission also carried a new strategy for Martian exploration, follow the water. It was clear that water had flowed over large regions in the past. The European Space Agency's Mars Express typifies the spectacular capabilities and successes of the latest high-tech orbiters. High above Mars, it can probe deep below the soil and at the same time assess the qualities of the atmosphere. This Martian satellite provides a stream of images and data that continues to rewrite the textbooks on Mars. While the cameras relay their exquisite pictures, the other instruments have been conducting their own unique investigation. Traces of methane have been detected in the atmosphere, and this could indicate that volcanic activity or even primitive life forms exist today. Other data reveals landscapes hidden beneath the surface terrain. Radio waves have penetrated the bedrock to reveal traces of vast water ice deposits covering large areas of the planet. As yet, we have discovered no liquid water on the surface. This is not surprising, since the very thin atmosphere would cause it to quickly evaporate. However, there are major features across Mars that obviously have been sculpted by running or still water in the past. Evidence even points to sudden and sometimes catastrophic water flows. Abrupt melting of the underground ice, either by volcanic activity or meteorite strikes, could be the cause. We have very little on-site information about the poles. The ice here consists of layers of frozen water and carbon dioxide. Surface ice exists at the Martian poles, the amount varies according to the season, but over the years, ice and dust have built up in massive layers. Measurements show that at the southern pole, there is sufficient water ice to flood Mars to a depth of over 30 feet. Recent observations have discovered dark streaks on the polar ice. Some researchers believe these have been caused by gases venting through the frost-covered surface. Could they be carbon dioxide geysers firing dark dust into the air? We don't know for sure, but it is an intriguing idea. On May 25, 2008, the Phoenix spacecraft landed just at the edge of the Martian North Pole. It will be able to drill deep into the icy soils and carries a tiny laboratory to test for organic compounds. Images of its Arctic surroundings will be beamed back to Earth. If all goes well, it will have about three months of life before it is entombed in the carbon dioxide ice of the polar winter. Temperature here is 200 degrees below zero. Further south, especially during summer, the temperature can be quite balmy at 50 degrees. Although the atmosphere is 100 times thinner than on Earth, the temperature difference between the ground and the air generates dust devils. 
These pockets of warm, rising air begin to eddy and swirl like a whirlwind. They pick up dust and debris and can become quite spectacular. Their earthly counterparts never amount to much. But just imagine if a dust devil in the Sahara could trigger a thunderstorm massive enough to cover the whole Earth. That's what's believed to happen on Mars, where a huge storm can cover the planet from pole to pole. Dust devils thrust up so much material that they heat up the atmosphere. This creates powerful regional storms that can spread quickly across the entire planet hiding Mars under a dusty blanket. In 2007, such a planet-wide storm made scientists fear for the safety of the two robotic rovers then on the surface. Somehow, these heavily dust-covered robots just managed to survive. Named Spirit and Opportunity, they have traversed the surface since 2004. The images and data which they have sent back have helped us refine further the story of Mars and provide additional data for the more remote instruments on the orbiters. Their most exciting discovery was silica. Its presence suggests that hot water springs once existed. On Earth, such springs harbour primitive life, did they also on Mars? As we enter a new era of Mars exploration with ever more sophisticated spacecraft, Mars is as tantalizing, as mysterious, and as exciting as ever. We've seen just how much our views of the red planet have changed over the last 100 years. As we began our investigation of this intriguing red dot in the sky, we discovered its mysterious canals and lines of vegetation, which were so prominent to Percival Lowell. He watched those dark markings expand and contract as the Martian seasons changed, and to him, these were clear signs of some form of life. Lowell's dreams of Mars influenced a whole generation of observers and writers, Writers who, until the 1960s, populated the planet with fantastic cities and alien life forms. Could this ancient world really be home to other intelligent beings? It's a good question. What this planet provided was a focus for our imaginations, a new vision of a new world, a new frontier, a new destination for brave explorers. At first a stage for fantasies, then a focus of intense scientific endeavor and study. While the winged planes of the 1950s still belong to the realm of science fiction, in the realm of science fact, engineers and scientists are designing the spacecraft which will explore Mars in the near future. At first, there will be ever-increasingly sophisticated robots. But one day, before the 21st century is 50 years old, the first manned vehicle will touch down on the Red Planet. It's possible that some of us here, or our children, will help design and build this craft. Others will crew it. And one of you could be the first person to step out onto that lonely, dusty Red Plain. The invaders of Mars will be humans. How our invasion will end, no one knows. It will be a second small step onto an alien world, a step that will take humankind to an exciting new future in the cosmos.
Well, there we have Invaders of Mars, produced by Evans and Sutherland, and thank you very much for their permission to uh, allow us to run this. They've been a great supporter. While the planetarium's been closed, we've been able to run a number of their shows for free online uh, programs like this so that people can stay in touch with the planetarium. We also um, would like to thank um, all of the folks that have been tuning in to our regular weekly show, Dome at Home, which is Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. That's sort of a live tour of what's up in the sky that's been running um, all the way from January, I guess, through March as part of the Manitoba Safe at Home grant program from the province of Manitoba. So that's all been fun stuff. We're going to be continuing programs uh, this Thursday again. Dome at Home has been extended for its second season, and that's going to be running uh, through April, May and June at the very least. We're contractually obligated to let these credits roll out here. Um, and so what we're going to do is, uh, as the credits roll out, we're going to talk a little bit about the current and future exploration of Mars. They talk about it there, but I mean, the, the show, I think it, it went up to about 2010 in terms of the most modern probes and discoveries. And so what we're going to be doing is looking at the more modern probes that have gone there and basically be able to see what's what's changed since this show was put together. Let's just switch over here. And there we go. So Mars, the planet, is a wonderful place to explore. It's got about the same land area that the Earth does. It's a smaller planet, but it doesn't have any oceans. It's all land at this point. And so it's kind of like exploring a whole new world in terms of the scale. And we've sent a number of robots to do that. No humans yet, but that'll be, you know, not too far in the future, we think. Right now, there, there are a number of orbiting spacecraft going around Mars. Some of them have been there for a decade or more. But these ones basically image the surface from above, but they also serve the purpose of sending radio signals back from the rovers that land on the surface. They can radio up to these satellites and then radio them back to uh, here on Earth. So that's how we can get a lot of our more modern information. The older spacecraft are still useful, not only for taking pictures, but also for exploring or um, bouncing the radio signals back to, uh, back to Earth. We've landed a bunch of robots on Mars. We've tried to land even more, but the, the, more, the two most recent ones are over on the right-hand side there. Perseverance, or Percy for short, is the one that landed in February. Brand new robot crawling around on Mars. We'll talk about uh, Percy in a moment. Down to the right there is Curiosity. Curiosity was in 2012, I think, and Curiosity and Perseverance were sort of um, I guess cousins at the very least, a similar kind of design. We'll talk a little bit about uh, both of those. The Americans are the only ones who have successfully landed probes on Mars. There have been other attempts, uh, most notably the old Soviet Union launched a bunch of Mars probes, and a number of them did make it to the surface, although they didn't uh, function afterwards. And so there, there was one that basically functioned for about 20 seconds, and then something went wrong and they lost contact. And that's, that's not just a Soviet thing. That's happened with a lot of different spacecraft, a lot of countries. It's hard to send spacecraft to Mars and have them work afterwards. It's, you know, about a 50-50 thing. Here's uh, actually, we just recently found what we think is one of those old Soviet Mars landers. The, the orbiting spacecraft can, can get really high resolution views. And we think we might've might have found one of those, but unfortunately we can't say for sure because just don't quite have the resolution. This is a, this is a picture of all of the spacecraft that have been sent to Mars. Only about half of those ones pictured there were successful. So that gives you a sense of, you know, we've been, we've been doing this for 50, 60 years now. You would think, well, do we know everything we need to know? Do we have, why do we keep going? Well, imagine if you explored the earth only by looking at 50 or 60 places on the earth, just randomly chosen. And you didn't, you, maybe you just randomly always landed in the ocean or you randomly landed always in a forest or whatever. The earth is such a varied planet and so is Mars. So to really understand it, you kind of have to keep going back and, and checking it out. Here we have the Curiosity rover it became famous for taking selfies of itself. Um, it's got 
down at the bottom there, there's a sort of an arm that sticks out and that arm actually can go up and point back at itself, take some pictures, go all the way around. And then they can also take pictures from that rectangular box on top of it and sort of edit out the presence of the arm. So it looks like the spacecraft is, you know, something else took the picture. It actually did take a selfie like that, but just through clever uh, images, it, it looks like it's sort of all by itself. This is what Mars is like. A red desert, lots of sand, lots of rock. There are the dust storms, the dust devils. This is a one that happened just right by the Curiosity rover. It just happened to be taking pictures and this is what showed up, just these little tornado things. The cool thing though is the evidence for water. There used to be lots of water on the red planet. In fact, there's still enough water in the in the polar ice caps at the North and South Poles that if you melted it all, you could cover the whole surface of Mars with water. There was probably even more than that. Where did it all go? Well, some's frozen in the ice caps. Maybe some of it is down in the ground. We're not quite sure yet. That's what Perseverance and other rovers are gonna do. So here's Percy, sort of the latest generation robots. It's about the size of a small SUV. It's got a big arm on the front with cameras and drills and all sorts of things. The thing is covered with cameras. You might have seen uh, back when it landed that there was high def video cameras all over it. So we actually got to see video of the of the spacecraft actually landing on Mars for the first time. That was pretty cool. That arm is what does all the science. It's got a bunch of scientific instruments on it, not only drills, but also sensors to try and figure out what the rocks are made out of and, and all that kind of stuff. Percy is going to be collecting samples of rocks and storing them away inside, and then a future mission will land nearby and come and grab them. So that'll be kind of, uh, kind of useful because then it's going to bring those samples back to Earth. That'll take a while. So Percy's sort of the, the front end of that. Here's one of the images that just came down uh, yesterday from Perseverance. And if you've ever been to, I don't know, Arizona, New Mexico, some of the high desert of the United States, this is not unfamiliar kind of views. This is Mars, but it looks a lot like some of the spots here on Earth. And again, more views where you can start to see the, the different layers of, of terrain, the craters and the um, hills and mountains and things like that. This is the part that I'm excited about. This is a shot underneath the underneath Percy. Basically, you can see the wheel there on the right. And that is uh, a helicopter in the middle there. The Ingenuity helicopter is a test mission to see if we can make a helicopter fly in the thin air around Mars. Don't know if it's going to work, but it's going to be really cool to try. They have picked a landing spot or a, a, a flying spot, I guess, and they're in the process of lowering it from the belly of Perseverance and the legs are folding out there and the, the spinning rotors are still folded up in the middle there. But sometime after spring break, I think they, they said no earlier than April 8th, they're gonna be taking their first test flights of that helicopter. That's gonna be really cool. It's never been done before, but if it works, it's gonna just provide some amazing pictures of uh, perseverance of the surrounding area. Like those drone shots they have in movies where you fly over the castles or whatever. It's just going to be amazing. And there's what the helicopter kind of will look like. It's it's actually really small. It's about the same size as a drone. You might buy it, you know, like a department store or whatever. It's only about this big, but it's all the way up there in space uh, on the planet Mars. Now, there are other missions there. Um, Mike was pointing out in our in our uh, trivia comments as we went along that the uh, United Arab Emirates has launched a mission to Mars. It's called the Alamal or uh, Hope Probe, and it is currently in orbit around Mars doing all sorts of science. They've only released one of the pictures that it took of Mars so far. I haven't been able to find any other uh, images, but it's doing a, a bunch of science images. They're probably just not you know, pretty pictures that are good for putting out in the news. China also has a spacecraft that is in orbit around Mars. This is the uh, Tianwen spacecraft. The, uh, the sort of um, white cone at the top there is where the rover is. It's still inside as this spacecraft orbits Mars. They're sort of scanning the surface and looking for the best place to land. And probably about May, the top 
part of the spacecraft will sort of pop off and it will then go down through the atmosphere and have the parachutes and the rockets and the whole thing and it'll land and then the little car will crawl off and start doing its exploration. So lots of cool stuff happening on Mars. There's the uh, there's what the rover will look like with all of its solar panels folded out and the little wheeled thing that it came off. If you uh, if you were, were in the science center a couple of uh, the science gallery, sorry, a couple of uh, summers back, we had a, a Lego rover very much like this one that was crawling around in there. So there's going to be lots more to come, but in terms of the uh, the science on Mars, lots of great pictures and stuff, but there are things that you can do right now in spring break to get into sort of the Mars feeling. We've got a little bit of a challenge for you. We'd like you to design a spacecraft that can land on Mars and not just design it in your head, actually build it out of recycled materials or cardboard or whatever you want. The goal is to have a pilot, here, let me hold it over here, survive the landing. Because when a spacecraft comes in, it comes in from a great height and it has to sort of slow down and land safely so that the pilot or the robot or the whatever's inside doesn't get damaged. We're going to be using eggs for this as a sort of surrogate for what goes inside. You can download this form off of the Manitoba Museum website. Uh, Mike is putting the links into the various chats and it basically gives you a challenge. We've had a few people um, already complete this challenge and send in some video of their various um, types of uh, experiments. We had uh, a couple of folks build one with no parachute and drop it from a height and uh, it actually survived. They, they had to spend a bit of time getting the pilot out of there. Other people have tossed their spacecraft out the window. Whatever you can do to make your, your uh, spacecraft test follow the rules there. There's some references there. It's a fun activity. If you've got some kids at home or if you're just interested in, in doing this, it's, it's a really fun engineering activity. Make sure you Put your little pilot in a plastic baggie though, just in case, you know, if something goes wrong, you don't want to get egg all over the place. All right. So Mike, were there any questions there that I didn't, uh, didn't get a chance to answer that you saw come up in the chats? Yeah, actually we've yeah, got actually. Uh, uh, Patrick on uh, Facebook wants to know if there are Northern lights on Mars. That is a great question. There are no northern lights on Mars. And the reason for that is that Mars does not have a magnetic field. Mars is, a, Mars is quite a small planet and the Earth is big enough that it sort of keeps some of its heat at the very center. You know, the core of the Earth is actually quite warm. And um, because of that, that basically it get, in a complicated way, that generates a magnetic field, a shield around the Earth. And it's the interaction of the sun and that magnetic field that makes the northern lights. On Mars, the planet is so small that the core basically has cooled off and become solid. And so there's no magnetic field being generated there. So all the radiation from the sun, instead of being blocked by the shield and then sort of pushed over to the North Pole to make northern lights, instead that radiation just hits the surface directly. And that's one of the big problems for sending humans to Mars. They get a lot more radiation than you do here on Earth. They don't have that kind of shield built into the atmosphere. So the fact that there's no northern lights on Mars actually helps us plan a little bit for the eventual human missions to get there. Good question. Yeah, it is a fantastic question. You got any others? There? Uh, yeah. yeah, I've got a question uh, from uh, YouTube. Uh, just sort of asking about how we've been able to test out some of these lander craft and know that they'll work uh, and operate on the surface of Mars? That is a good question. Um, the early ones, they didn't really know what to do and they just tested them by sending them to Mars and seeing if they survived. And that's kind of why the, the rate of, of success was not very high. But in more modern days, they do a lot of testing. They, they actually have tested, for example, the Ingenuity helicopter. They take it up to a high altitude, like up onto a mountain where the, the thinness of the air is a little bit more like the thin air on Mars, and they do tests there. Um, the parachutes, for example, the parachutes that have to pop out and, and allow these things to land on Mars 
are tested using Black Brant rockets, which are built right here in Winnipeg. And they basically launch them up in a rocket just so that they can fire the parachute out at the right speed to sort of simulate what it would be like coming into the Martian atmosphere. And the, the parachutes worked perfectly. So that testing really, really paid off. So there's that, there's that Winnipeg and Manitoba connection to the, uh, the Mars probes. Some of the other things, the cameras, the computers, they get tested on other space missions. Sometimes they get tested up on the International Space Station. And sometimes they're just brand new. Like Ingenuity, the helicopter, it's been tested as much as we can on the Earth. They still don't know if it will take off or not. They hope it will. They think it will. But you just can't test for everything, unfortunately. And so sometimes you test it uh, during the mission. And if it doesn't work, that helps you for the next time. We've got another question okay. from Facebook, uh, if you're okay with that, Scott. Of course, yeah. Yeah, okay. Keep them coming. Uh, is, there, is there evidence that the volcanoes are still active on Mars? Well, they're not active anymore. We're pretty sure of that because we haven't seen any evidence of eruptions. We think that they may have been active in the geologically recent past. So like tens of thousands of years ago, as opposed to, say, a billion years ago. But that's still, from, from my point of view, tens of thousands of years ago is still a long time. So again, because Mars is smaller, it lost a lot more of its, of its heat in the center. And so all of the magma, all of the lava that would have been you know, able to sort of squirt out of a volcano has pretty much already solidified. And so we don't expect to see active volcanoes on Mars at this point. Great, yeah. Uh, that's pretty much the questions I've seen so far, but Scott, maybe we could touch a little bit on how we communicate with uh, the orbiters and rovers. Uh, there's quite a challenge with that, and I think uh, it's important to understand just uh, what sort of the what sort of the the procedures for how we uh, talk and and communicate with our rovers. Yeah, it's a great it's a great point because Mars is really far away. Right now, Mars is about two hundred million kilometers away from the Earth, and you can't just, you know, grab a joystick and sort of drive your remote control car around because the signals take about seven minutes to get from here on Earth where you make the command before they get to the rover because the signals are traveling at the speed of light. And even though the speed of light is really, really, really fast, it still takes seven minutes to get there. So imagine if you're driving your car here down the street and there's a seven minute delay between you seeing something and you being able to turn the steering wheel. That's not going to work, right? So um, basically, they upload a bunch of commands, and then they wait to see the results, and then they upload a bunch more commands, and they wait to see the results. It's very, very, very slow. You, I, I think they were talking about how um, the first rover went something like a centimeter an hour, something like that. So it's really moving quite, quite slowly. The other thing they do with the more modern rovers, like Percy, it's basically a robot. It basically, you tell it where you want it to go, and it figures out by looking at its own cameras, by measuring the distances to, to the rocks, by figuring out which is the smoothest uh, route, it figures out how to get there, and it does it all itself. And so if it gets into a spot where it gets stuck, it knows to stop and to back up and to do those kinds of things. So it's really kind of autonomous. It's, it's making decisions all on its own without needing that, you know, that NASA mission control person who's seven minutes away to intervene. Nice. Um, Shauna on uh, YouTube is asking, have any of the rovers explored the polar regions of Mars? None of the rovers have, but we did have the Phoenix spacecraft, which landed, I think it was at about um, latitude 62 degrees or something like that. So quite far north. Um, uh, maybe it was even higher than that, actually. So that was the one. And actually, that was the one where Canada built a weather station to put on it. And so we were getting daily weather reports from Mars on um, this Canadian built equipment that was basically talking about the, the weather. And if I recall, that was a really, really cold winter here in Winnipeg. And so there were days where we were getting, you know, temperatures here in Winnipeg that were colder than the temperatures uh, being sent back from Mars. Now, it wasn't quite fair. It was summer on, on Mars and it was winter here in Winnipeg. But kind of 
it kind of shows you how close the planets are. Like Mars is only a little bit worse off than the Earth, and it's become totally uninhabitable. So that tells us a little bit about how important climate and and all of these things are, how delicate a balance it is for the for the Earth to be a place where we can live. Yeah, great. Uh, and just to confirm, Phoenix landed at latitude 76 degrees north. Nice, uh, way up Mars. there. So yeah, so way up there. Um, I, I think uh, I've not seen any questions, but I've, we've still got uh, a little bit of time if anyone wants to put them in the chat. But maybe Scott, you could talk about, I mean, we've learned a lot about Mars by sending craft there. Uh, but we can also learn a lot about it by what it's sending us, sort of. Uh, and of course, I'm talking about meteorites. Uh, do you want to just touch on that? And I think people might be interested to learn that method of how we've learned about the red planet. Yeah, absolutely. It turns out that there are already samples of Mars here on the Earth, and we didn't have to wait for a robot to go and get them for us. A long time ago, the solar system was a lot more crowded. There were a lot of small chunks of rock, asteroids, we would call them, floating all over the place. And they would crash into various planets. The, you, you look at the moon, it's all covered in craters. You look at Mars, it's got craters on it. The Earth would be covered in craters if we didn't have oceans that cover them up or you know active volcanoes that have filled them in or glaciers that have carved them away. The Earth has a lot of things to get rid of its craters, but most of the other planets don't. So these craters cover the solar system. Some of the impacts were big enough that, say, when the rock comes in and explodes, it sends other pieces away from the planet, and they actually can be moving fast enough to escape. So something hit Mars a long time ago and blew some pieces of Mars out into space, where they basically started orbiting the sun like a little miniature planet. And it just so happened that the orbit that they were on intersected the orbit of the Earth. And one day, we were in the same place at the same time, and that piece of Mars crashed into the Earth, hurtled through the atmosphere, and landed, and sat there for who knows how long. It might might have been millions of years. And uh, then it was found. And there's about, I think there's 12 or 13, maybe, maybe a little more than that, m confirmed Martian meteorites. And you can tell that they're from Mars partly because of the, the composition and also partly because of, um, by looking at the, the different isotopes, the different kinds of chemical elements inside, you can actually tell where they're not from. And so if you can rule out the moon, because we've got samples of the moon, we know what that's like, we, we can rule out the earth. Well, where else is it gonna come from? Venus is so covered with clouds that nothing's getting off that planet. Mercury is so close to the sun that anything that comes off Mercury is going to fall in towards the, the sun because it's so close. The only other place basically is either an asteroid or Mars. So we've got these Martian meteorites. And yeah, like, like Mike said, you know, we've, we've already got these pieces. The thing is, we don't know where they came from. Were they pieces from the mountains? Were they pieces from the valley? Were they pieces from, you know, we, we don't know the context where they came from. If you're, a, if you're a rock collector, you know, you know, where you find a rock is almost as important as what the rock is. So these Martian meteorites, they're useful, but we really want to be able to go and pick up a rock from a certain spot and bring that home to a lab. And so that's what Percy and, uh, and the follow-on missions will do. Good questions. Uh, yeah, that, well, I, and we, I do have some amazing uh, questions coming in. Um, oh, great. Uh, yeah, um, actually, there's a uh, Michelle on Facebook posted a link. Apparently, there are what known as proton auroras uh, that are visible only in ultraviolet uh, that do exist on Mars. So, uh, oh, not quite the north, not quite the northern lights that we see here on Earth, but uh, they were just uh, discovered just a couple of years ago. So, um, yeah. some fascinating things there. Let's uh, let's talk about um, the future uh, of Mars missions. I mean, we mentioned you know the idea that uh, we'll get some that are returning uh, back with samples. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our audience is curious to know about when will humans get there? How will they? What are the challenges? Uh, I know that a lot of this still kind of is in the realm of science fiction, but it's it's getting up there. And just wondering about your thoughts and uh, a quick analysis of that. Yeah, you know, going to Mars is a really difficult job, but it's not 
It's not the rocket side. I mean, the, basically the same kinds of rockets that we've built to take people to the moon or the space station components or things like that, that would do to put a rocket together. I mean, you'd have to make it a little bigger and you'd have to fuel it up more and things like that. The biggest problem is the amount of time you have to spend there. Mars is about eight months away from Earth at the best of times. And if you want to come back on that only eight month trip, you have to wait 26 months between times. So you're basically talking about it's a three year trip. It's not, it's not like a weekender or anything like that, like some of the moon missions. It is basically hitching up your wagon and going out to the West and you're going to build yourself a homestead or die trying. And so that's a very different kind of space mission. Like, how do you pack three years of food into a spacecraft? There's, there's no way. How do you pack three years of water? Well, we already know that, you know, on the space station, they recycle a lot of their water, uh, pretty much all of their water, if you know what I'm saying. And so there are technologies that are being developed to help that. But food is a really difficult one. You can't recycle food. It, it just doesn't work. There's only so much nutrient in the food. You have to be able to grow food. So what do you do? You take seeds along and you build a greenhouse? Well, the greenhouse has to already be there before you get there. So there's a whole bunch of things that have to happen before we put boots on Mars and actually send people there and walking around. And it seems ever since I was a kid, they always said, oh, in the next 25 years, we'll, we'll be uh, walking on Mars. I remember hearing that in 1979 and 1984 and 1992. 2000 and now they're saying well you know 20 years or so we'll be walking on mars i will we'll have to see it's one of those things that is just so complicated it might need some kind of breakthrough or some kind of uh push for people to to actually go ahead and do it like i say except for the food aspect a lot of the technology exists you just have to put it all together and spend the money to to sort of do it but it's very, very dangerous because of that long time period. And um, so if we had faster rockets so that you could like, you know, send a rescue mission if something went wrong, that would be great. But I mean, if, if, the, if the ambulance isn't going to get there for three years after any accident, that's not really going to help. So I think it'll be a while before we have humans on Mars, but we're going back to the moon in the next number of years. That's going to be a good test. We're living on the International Space Station, learning about how to live in space for long periods of time. Baby steps. And uh, eventually those baby steps will lead us to Mars. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, love to see it. And of course, so we maybe have some young listeners on the uh, uh, on our uh, chat right now who uh, may be some of the first people to travel to Mars. So that's exciting uh, to think about. Uh, I think we've got one final question. Uh, before I do, I just want to let our uh, uh, viewers know I'll be putting a link to a survey in the chat we really do appreciate if you take the time to answer just a few questions about this program uh but to wrap things up scott a great question uh on facebook from shiloh asking what would you do and maybe i'll expand it to what would humanity do if we find life on mars you know that's a great question i think there was life on mars in the past i'm not convinced that there is currently life there although there might be we we might not have looked in the right places yet but i think the conditions were such that there used to be life there for sure if we actually found life there now i think we kind of need to stop doing what we're doing and sending spacecraft and crawling around and doing experiments and things like that i mean say we find um bacteria well the earth used to be only bacteria and now we're here right so you, do you really want to mess around with that bacteria that might eventually turn into, you know, something else, some other intelligent being? Now, there are those who would say, oh, well, that's so long, long in the future. You don't know what's going to happen. We should just keep doing what we're doing. I don't know. I think if, if there's life on a planet that, that was there first, we kind of have an obligation to back off and let it do its thing. And maybe it'll take a billion years to to get to a point where we could talk to them or, or whatever. But still, I mean, life is important and life is, um, as far as we know, pretty rare. So the last thing we want to do is accidentally squish it or, you know, bring a disease or something like that to, uh, 
to uh, affect it negatively. So I, that's, that's kind of my own feeling. I know, like I say, there's lots of folks who are, are less worried about bacteria and more worried about, um, you know, going and exploring and things like that. So it's, it's a tough question. I'd like to know what Shiloh would do. <laughs> a good question. Yeah. Well, I think uh, that's about it for the questions that I've got here, Scott. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Um, again, if you're interested, we're, we're doing an encore presentation of this show as part of our Dome at Home show on Thursday at seven o'clock, but we'll also be doing some of our regular Dome at Home stuff where we talk about the constellations and the other things. It is on April Fool's Day, so um, that'll be kind of entertaining. We'll see what might happen at the at the show there and that show runs every thursday remember the museum is open and uh we're limiting our capacity people have to wear masks and then so on everything's being cleaned but it is a great place to drop by if you're looking for something to do during spring break and i hope that the planetarium and the science gallery will follow sometime soon in the future on behalf of the whole staff at the museum thanks very much for joining us and we'd love to see you again have a great spring break and we'll see you all sometime